But get going. Can't you speed it up by doing the big stuff first? Glassware is always done first. Got a good issue that I'd like me to be greasy. <laughs> Gosh, you get engaged and suddenly you're a glassware expert. <laughs> I learned that in home make class when I was your age. Okay, your point. Dump the rest in. Time's a wasting. You don't wash crystal that way. You put too much in the pan, it's not as easy to handle. Easy to handle, easy to handle. Oh, come on now, Betty. You know glasses should be put on a towel, not on the drain board like that. Never mind, I'll do it. I think you never had a date before. Never had one like Bill before. Good looking and smart, too. He's going to be a chemist. He's so intelligent. How did he ever decide on you? <laughs> oh, now look what you've done. You don't stack tumblers that way. What am I going to do? I thought you knew all the answers about glassware. Here's where your dumb sister teaches you something. First, you put gold water in the top glass, then you put the bottom glass in warm water. And voila! It's very simple if you know all the answers about expansion and contraction. <laughs> You're a genius. Naturally. Anything else you'd like to know? I'd like to know when you're going to finish drying the rest of the crystal. <laughs> right away. Cheaper as I'm late, Jane. Bill will be here any minute, and I'll... Betty? Uh-oh. Look what I did. Maybe it can be replaced, Betty. You mean we can get another glass just like it? Well, probably not just like it, but close enough so no one could tell the difference. You see, no two pieces of handmade glass are just alike. How do you know, Bill? Well, we had a lecture on glassware yesterday in class. Mr. Barton had a glass like this one, and he told us how it was made. It was just as if we had gone through the glass factory with him. He started at the beginning and gave us the whole story of glass making. I can remember him saying, An ancient miracle takes place in the furnace room of a glass factory. For over 5,000 years, men have been combining common elements of the earth and transforming them by fire and skill into graceful objects of art and better living. Now, the basic raw material of glass is fine white silica sand. At the Fostoria glass plant in Moundsville, West Virginia, carefully refined sand is mixed with precise amounts of such chemicals as potash, lead, or lime to impart the specific characteristics desired in the finished glassware. The batch is transferred to one of the pots inside the furnace. In this gas-fired inferno, the batch, which includes a percentage of reclaimed glass, will reach a white-hot temperature, and in 24 to 36 hours, the ingredients will be fused together into a purified pool of golden, glowing, molten glass. There are two general methods of hand-shaping molten glass, blowing and pressing. Blown ware is created in much the same way as soap bubbles. A pipe is dipped into the molten glass, and a master craftsman blows the gather, as it is called, into the desired shape. Now, here is another example of blown ware. Notice its delicate, graceful lines. Another type of crystal is pressed ware. These are the heavier pieces, such as this bowl. <coughs> Cups and saucers and plates such as this are made by pressing. Now, these depressions, which form the design, are made by forcing molten glass up against the sides of a cast iron mold. Pressed ware has an ancient and honorable history and American craftsmen have led the way in its development for the home. The forming of pressed ware begins right at the furnace, where the batch has been melted, blended, tested, 
and then cooled to a mere 2,000 degrees. Skillfully and with a dexterity born of generations of know-how, the gatherer picks up the exact amount of molten glass on the end of a tool known as a punty. The gatherer brings the putty with its gob of glass to the presser, and here is where fine crystal is born. The time-honored ritual that transforms a shapeless mass into a graceful vase is carried out with the aid of modern equipment. A cast iron mold imparts its shape to the pliant glass. A brief pause for cooling, and the presser unlocks the doors on a thing of beauty. Before the mold is ready for the next piece, it must be cooled in a draft of air to just the right temperature. Here, too, the craftsman relies on experience alone. The presser must be able to gauge the exact amount of molten glass required to flow evenly around the mold without overflowing when the pressure is applied. Each piece of pressed ware represents a blending of human skills. The original pattern is sketched by a designer. The drawing passes to the mold maker who begins with a block of cast iron and with hammer and chisel and infinite patience, he executes the intricate sculpture. The finished mold is as beautiful in itself as the glassware it creates. The pressings move from the mold to a smaller furnace known to generations of glassmakers as the glory hole, so called because the additional tempering by fire imparts extra sparkle, gleam, and luster to fine crystal. In the glory hole, the pieces are reheated so that they are always kept at working temperature. From here, they go to another craftsman known as the finisher. Working by eye and with a simple wooden paddle, he spins and twists and turns the piece, gently coaxing it toward the finished shape. The constant rhythmic motion of his hands never stops until his work is done, for the piece must be finished while it is still soft and pliable. The finisher is often called upon to create several different shapes from the same pressed piece, a skillful touch of the paddle and a sandwich tray is created. Even though the finishers work by eye and touch alone, the minute differences in the finished pieces can only be seen by very close comparison. When they have been brought to final shape, they must be annealed cooled slowly to relieve stresses and strains which would be caused by too rapid cooling. This is done in a 60-foot oven. A conveyor carries the glassware slowly from one end to the other. It emerges at room temperature, tough and durable, ready for the rigors of household service. To ensure quality, a percentage of each batch is subjected to a series of inspections, such as the polariscope test. In this instrument, polarized light is directed through the glass. If it is free from strain and stress, the image remains relatively clear. Sharp bands of colors indicate that unrelieved stresses are present in the piece. When these appear, the entire lot is re-tempered. There's another test where samples from each batch of pressed ware are immersed in boiling water. They are removed and instantly plunged into cold water. When it has been properly annealed, fine glassware passes this test without cracking. During the endless inspections, anywhere from 10 to 40 percent of the entire output is rejected. This glassware, much of it perfect to the untrained eye, will be broken up and re-melted. In another furnace, 
a batch of lead glass, so called because it contains lead for soft, brilliant luster, is ready for another set of craftsmen, the glass blowers. Here the gatherer uses a blowpipe instead of the punty. The gather is brought to a flat block of steel and worked back and forth until it has achieved the approximate shape required for the first blowing operation. The gatherer raises the blowpipe like a trumpet, a puff of breath, and the pipe passes to the blower. In this 20th century world of wheels and gears and shafts, of compressed air and conveyor lines, the glass blower is a lone figure. He relies on the touch of his own hands and the control of his own breath to create an object of lasting beauty. He lowers the gather deftly into a cork-lined mold. Then, gently blowing and turning, he forms it into the shape of a goblet for the table. Teamwork of a high order is needed here. But where mastery of a skill is passed from father to son, precise workmanship is a natural thing. In the glass blower, you find the pride of craft, the poise and dignity that have distinguished the master artisan since the world began. Molds and tools are his servants, but they can never create the thing of beauty that comes only from his magic touch. The first step in the creation of many fine crystal glasses takes place in a mold many other hands then contribute their skill. The bowl goes to a presser who adds the stem. The excess glass is snipped off then the foot setter takes the stage. He smooths the end of the stem and is ready for his gatherer. He cuts off just the right amount of molten glass. With a carbon squeezer, he turns and shapes the glass until he has formed the foot. last operation in the furnace room is straightening and finishing the foot. These pieces are placed on a conveyor for a slow trip through the annealing oven. They emerge at the other end more than two hours later, ready for finishing. The annealed pieces at last start down the long road that ends in the American home. First, they are visually inspected before a checkered background which shows up noticeable defects. There also, the excess glass is trimmed off. Many pieces that appear perfect to the untrained eye never pass this first inspection. To trim off the excess top, the edge is first scored with a diamond pointer. A short scratch will be enough to cause the top to snap. A jet of flame is directed against the scored line, causing the tops to crack off evenly. Then it's time for the finishing touches, which make the edges of fine glassware smooth and even. The pieces are placed in a grinder, which smooths the edges with precision accuracy. The inside edge is beveled on a rounded stone. The outside edge is ground on a cupped stone. After the blown ware has been washed, it moves on to the glazer, which imparts an even rounded rim. The pieces are placed on a conveyor, which moves them through the glazer at a precisely controlled speed. Inside the glazer, the rims are melted slightly so that they become perfectly smooth and round. This glazing process also makes the rims less liable to chip. At the end of the conveyor, the rims are inspected to see that they are free from nicks and surface irregularities. Defective pieces are placed upside down on the table. 
the others move on for a final critical inspection. That's the end of the line for plain blown crystal. However, a great percentage of the finished pieces pass on to other departments to receive a decorative pattern. The frozen poetry of master etchings in glass is an admirable blending of the ancient arts. The first etchings on paper bear the date 1513. Through the centuries, many masters have expressed their genius through this artistic medium. The names of Rembrandt, Corot, and Whistler are associated with the development of etching. But it remained for American craftsmen to blend the arts of etching and glassmaking. Etchings in glass are executed much the same as art etchings. The design that will eventually appear on glass is engraved by hand on a steel plate from which prints are drawn. The paper is trimmed to fit the glass. The print is laid carefully around the glass. Again, the delicate touch is of prime importance so that the design will be placed smoothly and without wrinkles. After the paper has been removed, only the design remains. Then the inside of the glass is sprayed with a light colored wax. This highlights the pattern so that the design stands out clearly. The goblets are then hand painted with a thick acid resistant wax. The rim, the inside and the foot all receive this protective coating so that the acid, which does the etching, will reach only the design openings. When the wax has set, they are ready for a dipping in a hydrofluoric acid bath. The operator must wear protective clothing and handle the pieces slowly and carefully to avoid splashing the acid. It takes about six minutes for the acid to do its work. When the goblets are removed, the design shows up a brilliant white against the black background of the wax. They are then thoroughly rinsed to remove all traces of acid. Cold water has removed the acid and the pieces are loaded onto a conveyor which carries them through a scalding shower. This melts the wax and washes the goblets. It may surprise you that drying is done with sawdust. There's nothing like it to impart a brilliant sheen and sparkle to glassware. The more they're rubbed, the shinier they get. Any loose particles that cling to the goblets are removed with linen towels. That completes the etching process and the results are amazing. The camellia pattern is particularly attractive, but there are many others equally as beautiful which will fit into any decorative scheme. Another method of decorating glassware that was old even in the days of Caesar and Alexander the Great is by hand cutting. Sometimes patterns are left unpolished with a frosted finish. These are called gray cuttings. When the original luster is restored by buffing or with acid, they are called polished cuttings. The art of cutting glass has survived through the centuries, and there are many exquisite pieces that are representative of the finest hand craftsmanship. Hand-cut crystal bears the inimitable grace and symmetry that comes only from the sensitive touch and the trained eye.
the story of glass making fascinated me, so I stayed after class and asked Mr. Barton a lot of questions. That's how I found out no two pieces will ever match exactly. But if you go down to the store tomorrow, I'll bet you can get another glass to replace it, and your folks will never know the difference. That makes me feel much better, Bill. Mother got these as a wedding present. She uses them all the time, too. I'll go along with you, Betty. Then I can pick out my crystal and find the bridal register. We're going to find you a twin tomorrow. Yes, that's the pattern, all right. This Dolly Madison pattern certainly is graceful, isn't it? Yes, it's lovely. Exactly what we want. We'll take it. Fine. I'd like to sign your bridal register and pick out my pattern. Maybe you can give me some help. Certainly. It's easy to make a mistake in selecting crystal. What do you mean? Well, there's several things to look for. First of all, feel the edge for smoothness and regularity. You see, inferior glass often has scratchy or wavy edges because of insufficient smoothing and fire polishing. Another thing to look for is clarity and luster. Good quality glassware is always sparkling and lustrous. And it has graceful lines that can be found only in fine handmade glassware. That's good to know. Here's another test. Take the glass by the stem. Tap the bowl with your knuckle. Like this? Hear the clear bell-like tone? Mm -hmm. That's a characteristic of good blown glass containing lead. Remember, though, the heavier pressed glass has no tone, but it's equally fine and durable. Here's another way to tell good glassware. Study the pattern carefully. With an etch design like this, it should follow the shape of the piece without any breaks or faults. Of course, no piece of handmade glassware is absolutely perfect without a bubble or other mark of some kind. But in quality crystal, defects are relatively few and inconspicuous. And it's always a good idea to select an American-made pattern in open stock so that you can replace broken pieces. You see, American manufacturers continue to make a pattern as long as it's still in popular demand. Thank you very much for your help. You're very welcome. Now, would you like to sign the bridal registry book? The crystal you select now will soon be in your own home. My first big supper party. Too many guests to sit at the table. But everyone likes a buffet. It's so informal and such fun. I want everything to be just right. Better check. Decoration centered. Start with the plates. Napkin on each plate. Silverware on the side this way. Glad I took Mother's advice and used this colorful tablecloth. It really makes the table so much more attractive. The meal should be simple. But be sure there's variety. I hope they'll like the salad. I'm going to need plenty of space, so it's best to have the table in the middle of the room. That way, people can serve themselves from all sides. Makes it easier to get at the coffee and iced tea, too. It does look attractive, if I say so myself. Never thought I'd be entertaining the folks for breakfast in my own house. What did they tell us in home ec about setting a breakfast table? Keep it simple. But make it look bright and cheery. One last look. Butter spreader on the plate. Napkins with a loose edged corner at the lower right. Place mats, since the tabletop has a polished finish. Settings directly opposite each other. Fine. Well, guess it's time to pour the coffee. Jim wants dinner tonight to be extra special. You don't entertain the boss very often. Hope he likes roast beef. What about Mrs. Scott? Bet she's an expert on table settings, so everything's got to be perfect. Let's 
see. Silver. The piece to be used next is always on the outside. The silver nearest the plate is an inch from the edge. Knives on the right, cutting edge toward the plate. Forks to the left, except cocktail fork, of course. Water glass at the tip of the knife. Napkin at the left of the fork, with the hem and selvage parallel to the edge of the table and the fork. Plates, one inch from the edge of the table. And oh yes, candlesticks above eye level. It's so easy if you know what to do. Jane? Jane? Mm -hmm. Stop daydreaming. I want to replace this glass before it's missed. I'll be with you in a minute. Betty? Jane? Yes, yes mother. mother. Will you please set the table for eight people? We're having company for dinner tonight. What glasses do you want to use, Mom? The crystal stemware, dear. Crystal stemware it is. <laughs> 